two games as compared to the rest of his career since he's had games late. Well, he's playing outstanding football right now. There's no doubt about that. He had a fantastic game against Clemson. Uh, I think they have two really good running backs. Both are very capable. So um, their offensive line does a really good job uh, of blocking your looks up front, uh, getting a hat on a hat, uh, and the runners are very talented. So uh, the combination of uh, the explosive ability that they have in the passing game, uh, the good receivers that they have outside, the speed that they have, the way they can stretch the field with the playmakers they have, the quarterback uh, can run or pass. Uh, and can make all the throws. So, you know, there's just a good all-around team, and they have great balance. And I think that's that's what makes them very difficult to defend. Next up, we'll hear from Ralph Russo. Hi, Nick. Thanks for doing this. Um, you've been asked a lot about your receivers, and Devontae's having an amazing year. Aside from just you're throwing the ball more and teams in college football are throwing the ball more. The emphasis on that position seems to have grown over in recent years. Why? Well, you know, I think that anytime guys can, you have guys playing any skilled position and they have ability to make explosive plays, uh, you want to try to take advantage of that the best you can. Uh, and I think sort of the advent of the spread offense, um, more spread formations, four open kind of formations, uh, spreads the field, which gives players on the perimeter a much better chance to make plays. And you have to tackle well in space. You got to get these guys on the ground, even if they catch short passes and turn them into long runs, uh, and their ability to you know, throw the ball down the field. And I think you know, the passing game in college football is probably what has sort of evolved in a very positive way uh, for most people. Uh, RPOs probably contribute to that to some degree, but really good play action passes that go along with the running game that most teams have, like Ohio State has great play action pass game, which they hit a lot of explosive plays on. I, I think having those kind of skill guys that can score points uh, are something that you certainly want to try to feature, and I see more and more teams trying to do that. Next up, we'll hear from Dennis Dodd. Dennis? Hey, Nick, thanks for doing this. Um, you've had such great success with juniors um, advising them whether to stay or go. Uh, I wonder what that conversation was like with Najee, um, and obviously it's paid off this year with the kind of season he's had. Well, I, I think what we try to do is be realistic with the players in terms of helping them make a good business decision for you know, them and their family. It's ultimately their decision. Um, and I think that we try to make them aware of, you know, how the money sort of goes down uh, in the draft. And do you have a chance to improve your value if you stay and play college football? You know, there's no developmental league in football different than baseball has minor leagues, hockey has a minor league, uh, NBA has a D league or whatever it is um, where they can develop players. But you know, football is kind of all or nothing when you sign up for the NFL. And um, so the one place that you can continue to develop and create value for yourself is to stay in school. If your draft grade is not what you think it could be, then you have a chance to enhance your value. And when you enhance your value and the guaranteed money that you get, uh, it also creates security for you and is really the best way to, you know, help your family. Thank you. Next up, we'll hear from Bill Rabinowitz. Hi, Nick. Uh, obviously, your offense is elite, and I know your defense has had a couple games when it gave up a lot of points. How do you view the way your defense has played? And as a defensive coach in an era of exploding offenses, how do you kind of assess, how does that make you assess or reassess how well a defense is playing? Well, I, I think that you know, consistency and performance is really, at the end of the day, what determines, you know, how well you're playing. Uh, and we have played well in some games, you know, this year. Uh, other games, not as good as we'd like. Uh, and as coaches, we need to do a better job of putting our players in a better position so they have a chance to be successful. Uh, we've played some 
I think we played four top 10 teams this year and some very explosive offensive teams and uh, been very challenged uh, with, you know, four out of five new starters in the secondary. And those guys have improved dramatically. And I think we need to continue as a team on defense to focus on things that we can improve on so that we can play with a little more consistency game in and game out. Thank you, Coach. Next lawyer from Kirk Bowles. Kirk. Yeah, Nick, uh, is there anything about Steve Sarkeesian that separates him from other offensive coordinators that you've had? And since you'll be playing him in a couple of years at Texas, uh, why can't any of your former assistants beat you in a game? Well, I think that's probably only a matter of time. Um, so, you know, we've had a lot of great coaches here and they've done a great job for us. And we're always happy to see them um, you know, get opportunities. Uh, that's what I think they work hard for uh, when you're an assistant, whether you're an assistant to be a coordinator or a coordinator to become a head coach. And, you know, Sark has done a marvelous job here. He's uh, very well organized. He works well with all the people uh, in the organization, players and coaches alike. Um, he's a good play caller on game day. He does a really good job of preparing the players game plan wise for, you know, each and every game. And, uh, he d he's just done a great job, and he's uh, been a real asset to our organization. And, you know, I think he'll be very successful uh, as a head coach. So, uh, and he's taken over a, a good program. So uh, it's going to be challenging for anybody that plays them in the future, I think. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Charlie Potter. Charlie? Hey, Coach, I just want to ask you about the, the Heisman Trophy ceremony tomorrow. You've obviously attended several of these in person, but this one's virtual. Just what are your plans to watch it, and, and how happy are you for guys like Mack and Smitty to be named finalists? Well, I'm really happy for our players, to all players that have a chance to be recognized. Um, you know, it's, it's always great, and you always love it when your players get recognition. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of players on our team that have done a great job all year that are not going to receive recognition. And... Uh, I think that's a lesson in life because sometimes you do great things in life and you don't get recognized for it, but you have to kind of satisfy yourself in knowing that you did your best to be the best you could be. And I certainly feel like the guys that are up for awards uh, and have an opportunity, hopefully, to win some of these awards uh, have done just that. And hopefully they'll get rewarded for it. Um, you know, internally, we kind of keep our plans, you know, to ourselves in terms of what we're going to do. and. Um, I'm going to talk to the players about it today. Thank you. Next up, we are from Michael Essa Granada. Uh, yeah, uh, just Nick, what, what you guys learned from that 2018 title game with the coaching distractions surrounding uh, departures, and how do you think that will help this week with Steve Sarkeesian? Well, you know, I think. We've had several of these situations uh, where we've had guys playing in the national championship game and guys are getting head coaching jobs someplace else. And uh, I think it's up to each individual. You know, I went through it when I became the head coach at Michigan State and I was a defensive coordinator of the Cleveland Browns with Bill Belichick. And we had like five or six games left to play in the season and had a chance to get in the playoffs, which we did, and went too deep in the playoffs, won the first game, lost the second. But I think you you just have to you know separate yourself and focus on you know look if it wasn't for the players if it wasn't for the players at the Cleveland Browns being the best defense I probably would have never got the Michigan State job so you kind of owe it to the players right, to give your best uh, to do your best to help them get prepared for the game so they can play well in the game well, that's how I always felt I think that's how Sark feels and um, you know. Most of the guys in the past have been able to do that and been effective. Um, and it's not been a distraction for us. And, you know, we're going to try to help manage it every way that we can so that it's not a distraction for us this year. Thank you. Next up, we'll hear from Dan Hope. Hey, Nick, wanted to ask you about uh, Ryan Day, uh, how well do you know him and kind of what do you see in him as an offensive play caller? Well, I don't know Ryan well. I've met him before. Uh, I think he's an outstanding coach. I think they do a, 
a fantastic job, you know, with their team, the way their team competes, the way the team plays, the discipline, uh, the togetherness that they have, the way they execute. Um, and offensively, you know, he does a good job of, you know, trying to manage and control the tempo of the game uh, on offense. Uh, and they do a really good job of executing, which is all about, you know, coaching your players to know what to do, how to do it, why it's important to do it that way. And they, they do it extremely well. And they present lots of problems with the system and the scheme that they run. But uh, they do a good job of executing it, which is really probably the most important thing, you know, you like to see, you know, as a coach. And you know, Ryan's certainly done that there at Ohio State. Uh, really with his entire team. Uh, but, you know, I know he's probably a little bit more involved with the offense, and they do an outstanding job. And our final question today for Coach comes from Lane Higgins. Lane? Hey, Coach. Thanks so much for taking this. Um, I wanted to ask a little bit about one of the things you mentioned earlier with kind of this passing revolution that's happened in college football. And it seems like a lot of that began, at least for your program, the last time that you played Ohio State in the semi or in the championship game in 2014. And I'm curious, you know, how much do you think that that game was maybe a watershed in how Alabama approached, you know, offensive play calling and structure and also maybe, you know, as Alabama goes, so does college football? Well, that was a great game. I think the score was like 42 to 35. They had a great team. Um, we had a very good team. And uh, as it turned out, you know, they won pretty handily in the national championship game. So uh, which indicates, you know, what a great team they had. Uh, so I don't know that any of our players on our team were around, you know, back then. Um, so I don't know that how that affects this game. Uh, I think this game is all about how do you prepare for this game? Um, you know, what, what do you do today and every day leading up to this game to prepare yourself to, to play the best that you're going to play, assuming that the guy you're going to play against may be the best guy you played against all year. So um, I, I think that's got to be more the focus. And I don't know that the history of that game has a whole lot of impact on how we think or what we do or how our players think in terms of what they need to do.